Nixon in office. So when we're looking at Nixon and his administration's like foreign policy, we're gonna see a lot of the triumphs he has are really legacies from like previous administrations from you know Eisenhower all the way through Kennedy and LBJ. For instance, we have the space race. On July 20th of 1969, Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong would complete the longest journey anyone had taken, and they will successfully land on the moon. This is the Apollo 11th expedition, and it is really combining science, technology, and Cold War politics. Now, the American flag being put on the lunar surface is supposed to symbolize America's victory in the space race. However, I should point out that if you probably ask someone from the Soviet Union at the time, the fact that they were, you know, the first to send um, a man around the globe and um, get their rockets up into space first and everything, they probably would say that was their symbolic victory. So depends how you look at it. Um, after that, though, the United States astronauts are going to make about five more trips to the moon from 1969 through 1972. And all of this is going to help restore the nation's standing as a scientific leader across the globe, as a technological leader around the world. Uh, for Nixon, a lot of foreign policies he puts in place is not about like crusades or, or like some sort of moral stance. It's more about balance. And this is the balance of world economic power, the balance of world military power. It was about things like securing the most advantageous agreements, the most advantageous alliances, the most advantageous military positions. So the United States is going to accept the Soviet Union's parity as a nuclear nuclear power however while they accept that okay <laughs> both sides are going to have nuclear weapons and everything we're going to try to avoid any kind of military confrontation and resist the spread of communism since 1950 though the united states had basically acted like china just didn't really exist after we saw China fall to communism. And so what happened was America had refused economic relations with China and insisted that the nationalist regime in Taiwan that you can see pictured here, that island was actually the legitimate Chinese government. However, fast forward back to 1969. Yeah, China almost goes to war with the Soviet Union. Nixon takes advantage of this tension between China and the Soviet Union. And so he'd have secret talks that lead to easing an American trade embargo with China starting in 1971. Plus, this is when you get the tour of China by the United States table tennis team of all things. And that kind of also helps ease the relationship. Um, then we get Nixon's visit with uh, Mao Zedong on, in Beijing in February of 1972. So all of these things combined are easing the relationship between China and America. But not only that, it's also going to help improve America's relationship with the Soviet Union. Because basically the Soviet Union needed to increase trade with the United States, basically to counterbalance um, their lost trade with like China and such. So actually, we get negotiations between the United States and the Soviet Union at this time that will lead to SALT, S-A-L-T, which was the Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty. This is going to be signed in Moscow by Nixon in May of 1972. It basically blocked the creation of extensive anti-ballistic missile systems, so ABM. That being said, SALT did not limit bombers, it didn't limit cruise missiles, it didn't limit multiple independently targeted warheads on single missiles. This is not a friendship between the United States and the Soviet Union. This is more just an easing 
of tensions more than anything else. But all of this means that we're being able to facilitate travel safely between like the United States and China. And we're seeing, you know, like United States farmers will be able to sell like wheat to the Soviet Union. So it's really an easing of all of this tension that is the, so, uh, the Cold War. And the world is a safer place because of it. Now, if you come back to America and looking at Nixon's domestic program, a lot of this is about winning re-election, quite frankly. Uh, he really wanted to solidify middle American support for himself. And so it's very much going to be targeting like the growing population of the South and specifically like suburbs and blue collar voters. Nixon generally ignored the troubled big cities of America. In fact, he announced that the whole urban crisis was over and he would go on to dismantle the urban initiatives of like Johnson's whole great society. Though, quite frankly, a lot of those programs had never been given enough money to begin with to make a huge difference. Instead, Nixon tilts a lot of federal assistance towards the suburbs. Um, the big centerpiece of this is going to be the general revenue sharing made in 1972. Basically, this is going to pass federal funds to local governments with no limits on how they could use these funds. But this ends up being a suburban aid program because you get these no string grants that are supplementing general funds to every full service government and they're giving the same amount of money to all of these governments whether they were a city with two million people or a suburban town with only 500 people so you can imagine who's going to get more out of this um, we're also going to see nixon puts forward some supreme court nominations like clement hensworth of Florida and G. Harold Carswell of Alabama, and both are going to actually be rejected by the Senate as unqualified. But these kinds of nominations basically gave Nixon a reputation as being a champion of the white South. Um, we see Nixon a lot of times is like inflammatory in his speeches, but then he's actually pretty moderate in his action. Um, because as much as he's putting these, you know, more white supremacists, trying to nominate them, he's also increasing funding to the federal civil rights agencies. And then we have inflation, um, a big domestic issue at this time, because what happens is basically wages aren't keeping pace with inflation starting in about the late 60s. Um, what this means is inflation means the cost of items is growing. Um, you want inflation to happen, however you need wages to match it and it wasn't matching it. And so what happens is like the value of people's savings and pensions are losing value because everything's being more expensive but they're not getting the wages to match it. Um, this also means that United States goods are too expensive for a lot of foreign buyers. And so this starts generating a trade deficit where America is buying more goods than they are actually selling. This is going to place a lot of pressure on the international value of the dollar. So in 1971, Nixon is actually going to detach the dollar from the gold standard. And so this means that the dollar is now able to float in value relative to other currencies. Um, this makes the United States exports a lot more competitive again, but it does undercut the nation's ability to lead in a global economic policy. So on one hand, you could say it weakens the United States as a leader around the nation, but it probably gave America really a more healthy credit system and economic system overall long term. Uh, we're also going to have another issue with inflation during this time that was cost push inflation. Basically, this is when the price increase of one key product rises the cost of all other products. In this case, the cost of oil is going to rise. Um, and oil is tied into so many other things, especially as we're seeing America become more suburban and more car oriented and everything during this time period. 
Um, basically, what had happened is a lot of oil producing nations were angry at the United States because the United States had supported Israel in the Arab-Israel War back in October of 1973. And so Arab nations would then go on to impose an embargo on oil exports that lasted from, um, it was like October of 1973 through March of 1974. So we have less oil being sold to America. And so this means a shortage of oil in America, meaning the price of oil goes up, supply and demand. Now, this is going to be eased up when the embargo would end, but we are going to see at that point the organization of OPEC, and that is pictured here. OPEC is the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, and basically the formation of OPEC would challenge the ability of like industrialized, or I should just say industrial nations, to dictate world economic policy. Because now America couldn't necessarily play off these nations against each other to get like better oil prices and such because they're all working together when looking at like oil exports. What we're seeing though here with inflation, whether it's cost push inflation or just inflation in general, there's an underlying problem in the United States economy and it is going untreated. We're also seeing the United States is no longer being able to dominate the world economy by itself. And this leads to some worries of stagflation and the stagnant economic growth and such. And there's concerns because now we're seeing higher rates of unemployment along with that inflation. We also are going to see in the 1970s, resource conservation grows into a multifaceted environmental movement. The thing is back starting in about the 1950s, Americans started to actually pay attention to issues like pollution. We get like books on the issue of pollution and then you get things like offshore oil wells, polluting beaches, um, industrial discharges, igniting rivers, things like that. And then we see like the suburbanites seeing this urban sprawl providing housing and shopping centers, but at the cost of bulldozing, you know, forests and farms. Um, people are aware of the pollution up streams and smog choked skies. So by the time we get to the 70s, environmentalism really is gaining strength. So we're actually going to see the first Earth Day during this time. It was conceived by Wisconsin Senator Gaylord Nelson. It's gonna have a grassroots following across the country. It's also really important to point out the environmentalist agenda. Well, that's great. Um, it also was meant to be a smokescreen of sorts. It was meant to divert attention away from the discontent during the 60s and all the protests and everything. Uh, we are going to see the creation of the EPA or the Environmental Protection Agency in 1970 on January 1st. This is going to enforce environmental laws and you get all kinds of legislation on like clean air, clean water, pesticides, hazardous chemicals, endangered species. And so basically what we're seeing is America is becoming a lot more aware of all of the human caused environmental hazards. They're also becoming a lot more aware that a lot of times minority and low income communities have more than their fair share of these problems. Like for instance, a lot of times like landfills and waste disposal sites tended to be located right next to minority neighborhoods in particular. So up till this point, what would you say is your impression of Nixon so far? <laughs> 